This is a picture of our main operating theatres taken on a Tuesday lunchtime. It is completely empty. And I'm sure this is a situation reflected throughout the country. And if we look at the theatre allocation, most of the theatres are empty. Two have been taken over by ITU. And there's an emergency CPOD list and a trauma list going on. Nothing else. This is the recovery unit that has been taken over by ITU. It is our third COVID clean intensive care. So what is happening in cancer? I think the situation is quite different depending on where you are. There are cancer hubs being set up. Cancer is being done in different hospitals. It's being moved to cold sites and in other hospitals it's being done in the trust. Emergency surgery now is static, although patients didn't come in in the first wave. Elective surgery is certainly down and logbook numbers are down. I think it's recognised that certain specialties are affected a lot more than others and certain specialties have changed their practices and perhaps new innovation has been introduced. Certainly I believe that oncology services have changed their practice and this is something we can talk about. The private sector is offering training and undoubtedly trainees are going to need extra training time, especially those in craft specialties. Trainees have been deployed to ITU. They've had positive and negative experiences there, but undoubtedly we're all very grateful for the work they've done. And there have been psychological aspects to the trainees, to consultants, to other healthcare professionals, and this has had a big impact on the NHS. And undoubtedly, we're going to see recruitment issues. I'm aware of a massive bottleneck building up between core and higher. I know that this is present in surgery and it's probably present in other specialties as well for a variety of reasons. And undoubtedly, there are patient waiting times which have been increased. I'm not sure about cancer, this is what we can talk about, but certainly in elective surgery, there are big waiting times. Anyway, let's get on with our discussion. Thank you very much. So welcome to the 63rd COVID series on Thursday lunchtimes. Today, we have an incredibly distinguished panel. We have Professor Claire Turnbull, who works at the Institute of Cancer Research and also has a clinical appointment at the Royal Marsden. Professor Neil Mortensen, who is, professor, who is Professor of Surgery at Oxford and is the President of the Royal College of Surgeons of England. And Professor Gary Middleton, who is appointed by the University of Birmingham. Um, welcome to the three of you and thank you very much for joining us. I'd like to start the discussion, please, by asking about waiting times and what effect this is having. So Claire, perhaps you could kick the ball rolling. So thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Humphrey. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so by way of putting this in context, I um, uh, last March um, redeployed myself over the, to the Marsden to try to help out and got involved in looking at their cancer data and their prior uh, prioritization around surgery and thinking about which types of patients we would and wouldn't prioritize for surgery given limited capacity and thinking about outcomes and then we started looking at also prioritization and impact of not just delays to surgery but delays to investigation so this is how I came into looking at these types of data and then over the last year have crunched various types of numbers for different people and had the privilege of discussing these complex issues with a number of extremely um, wise and insightful epidemiologists and statisticians. So in terms of um, waiting times, um, as you said, the cancer pathway is complex. Patients need to go to their GP. Their GP would then refer them in typically. Uh, they'd have some investigations to diagnose their cancer. Many people, these investigations would be normal. Um, they then may have some more investigations to better define their cancer, what stage it is. 
um, and uh, a decision of how to treat them. Uh, they would then go onto a waiting list for that treatment. So that may be surgery or that may be radiotherapy, chemotherapy, or there may be a decision not to have uh, treatment with curative intent. Um, so there are lots of different steps in the pathway, but it's very clear um, that there are significant increased weights around relevant diagnostic procedures and significant increased weights around surgery. So, for example, um, colonoscopy was particularly hard hit last year. Uh, that's in part because there were concerns about risk of infection from colonoscopy, um, also because many of the relevant clinicians were diverted off towards um, uh, acute COVID management. Um, but certainly we saw the waiting list for colonoscopies, which normally sits at around 100,000. Um, uh, by August last year, it was more, it was up around 160, 170,000. We could then see it actually going down in September, October time, but uh, we're getting data in showing that that's unsurprisingly flicking up again. Um, in terms of the surgical waits, uh, less pronounced waiting times, it seems, for patients with a first diagnosis of cancer, and particularly those who have come through the two-week wait pathway. So those waiting times are well collected in the 62-day wait, um, but there definitely seems to be, um, both from the data and anecdotally, very sizable waits for people particularly wanting and uh, needing surgery where it's, a, it, where it's not a first presentation. And the classic case, um, and uh, Gary was just discussing this offline earlier, is around those patients who have um, solitary metastases and in particular um, liver or lung um, and would be having either surgery, interventional radiology. These are patients who can often be well managed for months, if not years. Um, but their surgeries are, are, be, are being very sizably delayed. So yes, big problem with waiting times, both in investigation and treatment. And the NHS, I think really um, because of problems with patient flow, problems with slowing things down with infection control and just general operational problems and getting things running, we're, we're not even running at normal capacity now, let alone the ability to kind of eat into those waiting times. Really interesting data. Thank you very much, Claire. Neil, would you like to comment, please, on surgical waiting times? Yes, Humphrey, thank you. And um, hello, everybody. And thank you for inviting me on to the show. Of course, in my job, uh, I have been a colorectal surgeon, but now as president of the College of Surgeons, I'm full time busy with this one. And of course, I have a responsibility to the whole of the surgical community, although I've done lots of cancer myself. But these figures of 4.5 million on the waiting list, 220,000 waiting more than 52 weeks are a record sum. And of course, we somehow in this whole waiting list discussion, have to balance the relative merits of, for example, cancer and children going through developing milestones, cleft lip and palate, for example, they've got to have their operation around year one, versus all those patients waiting with mobility problems with hips and knees, the majority of the wait list, as well as, for example, cataract surgery. We somehow have to balance all this. And when we talk about solving the waiting list issue, there's got to be some way in which we share out the pain. It's very difficult. The current situation with regards to cancer, as far as I can see it, as you suggested at the, at the beginning, Humphrey, is that there is a lot of regional variation. Some places have managed it really, really well. For example, I work in Oxford. All the breast cancer was done in the independent sector during the surge and was completely unaffected. And most of the major abdominal cancers, including liver surgery, interestingly, has hardly been affected at all, but that's because they had the, if you like, geographical luck to have separate sites for the acute take and for, if you like, the planned surgery uh, in a in a green, clean site. So um, we can begin we can begin the discussion there, but it's obviously very complicated. Yeah, thanks very much, Neil. Gary, what, 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 how have you seen the the waiting list issue? Yeah, I mean, I can only really speak to my own local area. We've been very, very heavily hit here in the West Midlands, um, where I work in clinical work with the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, Birmingham. It's a very, very large ITU. It's been extremely busy with COVID, with a huge number of ventilated patients, and it's had a, a big, big effect. 
Um, one can't deny that. And I think it comes from a number of reasons. I mean, first of all, we've got the redeployment issue. We've needed to redeploy surgeons to work in intensive care. Um, and so that means they're not available to do lists. Um, the other thing, of course, is anaesthetists. They are doing a, a somewhat different job now. And again, availability of anaesthetists has been a, a very big factor. So that in terms of list numbers uh, per week, it's actually gone through the floor, really. Um, as in other places, they've been operating uh, really quite well, actually, in private facilities and doing that. There is a little bit of a limitation around that. So, for example, in the private facilities that we've been using, laparoscopic work can't be done. So, for example, the, any liver resection uh, will be done as an open procedure rather than a laparoscopic procedure, which is not ideal for all these patients. So, their options are a little bit limited. But the bottom line is, yes, I can see in my own practice, and this is at the completely other end of it, rather than the sort of early diagnostic of early stage cancer that there is already a wait and patients that were sort of teed up to have their liver resections or to have their pulmonary metastasectomies they are being delayed and so we're having to sort of carry on with a bit more chemo with a bit more toxicity etc cetera, etc cetera. so it, it certainly is having a bit of an effect and I think actually this third time round it's been a lot worse I think the first time round you know last year we kept sort of plodding along but I think this time it's been been hard work and of course there's been the added ultra emotional hit on on doctors and nurses which has been a real big thing I think you know there's no doubt that I see a difference mentally and psychologically and emotionally between you know even a few months ago these last couple of months have been a real grind for people so I think it, it, it there's no doubt that one can see it out there I mean the sort of data that we've already got about the increasing wait list particularly for colorectal you know colorectal is a, a great example because it's such a common cancer it's diagnosed early on screening and then you can have curative surgery and the impacts of that in terms of the sort of amount of screening that went on I mean the screening numbers went down through the floor down to sort of you know three to one percent of the normal bowel screening project numbers going through in that first 10 weeks of COVID, COVID impacted time I mean that's had a profound effect um, in terms of the numbers of missing cases so to speak um, you know in the thousands and I, I think we will be reaping this for, for some time to come. Okay well thanks very much Gary. Um, it, it's interesting because uh, I didn't introduce myself at the beginning. Um, I'm Humphrey Scott and I'm Dean of the RSM. And I'm also a practicing colorectal surgeon at St. Peter's and I've seen exactly what, what Gary has, has been talking about. So, um, Neil, there is some discussion about an undiagnosed bulge of patients coming up. We haven't seen them yet, but they're probably out there. What are your thoughts about that, please? Well, I'm obviously um, very worried about it. I think Claire has some actual data on it. Um, I think it's undeniable that during the first and second waves, and now during this third waves, there have been patients who've been frightened to go to their GP. Maybe getting access to the GP has been difficult. Getting access to diagnostics has been difficult. So there is going to be a sizable chunk of patients who have yet not been diagnosed. And of course, they will be added not only to the ones who are currently being diagnosed in the normal way, also onto that great big chunk of patients who are waiting for their surgery. My understanding around the whole prioritization issue in the south of the country is that uh, we've had this uh, priority two, must have your operation within four weeks, that's now been divided into P2A within two weeks, P2B within four weeks. And a lot of that is very, very slowly beginning to fall over. It's just becoming unmanageable. I think uh, the situation is really tight for those patients. And obviously within that are quite a lot of cancer patients. Yeah, absolutely. Claire, you've got some data, have you? So th there certainly have been a number of analyses performed that um, across the piece that cancers are registered, we're, we're good at registering cancers in the UK. So there are the cancer registries for England, Wales, and then Scotland and Northern Ireland. And there's a reasonably predictable number of cancers per um, reference population each year distributed across the different cancer types with age stage distribution. And there was a very significant um, dip in the number of, um, on a number of metrics. So for example, the two week wait referrals, the number of individuals on the um, 31 day wait, that's the priority two wait 
um, uh, the number of patients undergoing um, treatment and so forth. So each of these metrics doesn't tell the full story. Um, Public Health England and the Disease Registration Service have also seen a drop in cancer registrations, but there are a number of caveats because those are the preliminary registrations and those data do require a lot of um, uh, fine tuning and um, corroborating. But there definitely seems to be um, across these data sets a dip that happened certainly over April, May, June last year that hasn't been compensated. Um, and the hypothesis is that those patients are still out there. Um, the other explanations are that they have come in through other routes, um, either that they've come in uh, as emergency admissions and the diagnoses still need sort of uh, fine coding. Um, and the other possible explanation is some of them may have been absorbed in um, deaths attributed to COVID-19 or patients who died at home who didn't have postmortems who weren't investigated. Um, but it does seem overall the data point to the fact that actually the stay home and, and don't trouble the NHS message has been very effective and people with non-specific symptoms may have been sitting on them longer. And that may be contributed by, to by telemedicine as well. Um, again, we don't have evidence for this, but is there something having the patient in front of you that you can see, I don't know, they look more cachectic, they look less well. So, so some kind of subtle signs that are less well captured um, via a telemedicine um, a a, a consultation. But either which way, there are a lot of pointers that actually we, we have not just our steady state to deal with over the next three, six, 12 months, but also potentially a, an additional bulge, as well as dealing with the, the backlog that we've all been speaking about. So I think, as Gary said earlier, um, it, we are a, a, a long way off getting on top of this. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure that's the case. Gary? In terms of sort of delayed diagnosis of an impact and whether there's still patients sitting out there, I mean, I do colorectal and lung, and I think in lung, it's anecdotal this, but I'm sure this is the case, um, we're seeing a huge number of very late presentations. So I think one of the big problems, of course, is that there's going to be a huge amount of stage migration going on here. So instead of patients going to their GP, primary care, secondary care, and getting referred on because they've got a bit of a cough or whatever, they've been sitting at home having a bad cough, getting worse and worse and worse. And of course, with a disease like lung cancer, you know, with a median survival is very short, untreated, then they're becoming very poorly and then presenting at the front door, very breathless with bad cough, being brought in a, a, an emergency uh, presentation diagnosis is made. And we all know that that results in a much worse outcome for these patients. So there's a huge amount of stage migration. In our MDT, we sit there discussing one after another patients who are performance stages three and four with a radiological diagnosis, not fit enough for any treatment. And I'm sure I can perceive that there's a big difference to even a year ago with that. So I think for certain cancers where you've got rapid progression and rapid metastatic progression, um, then definitely we're seeing very delayed diagnoses and that's having a profound impact on it. And it's, again, with some of the, the, the curable diseases, you know, um, some of the work that Claire's done and people like, uh, you know, Maringi at the London School of Tropical Medicine show that just a few months of delay in the diagnostic pathway and in terms of surgery can have quite a profound effect on worsening outcome, for example, with stage two and stage three colorectal cancer with a, a huge number of life years lost on the basis of a reallocation from primary and secondary care and screening uh, referrals to two-week wait rule stuff and emergency presentations. It's all about that stage migration effect and, and that is, uh, that's quite profound. So Gary, that's great. Um, we're, we're getting lots of questions in and we did have a lot of questions beforehand. Uh, Peter borg Botello, actually, Gary, asked specifically to you, but I'd like everybody to address this. Uh, do any more up-to-date immunological oncology treatments provide a better solution around COVID or compared to surgical treatments for more advanced care? That's a great question. So I'm uh, the chair of the UK CCMP, which is the UK Coronavirus Cancer Monitoring Project. We started on the 18th of March and we've been collecting assiduously through the REDCap system about outcomes of cancer patients. Um, now we've got 
about three three thousand three hundred twenty three on the register now. Um, we're just finishing off a, a third sort of milestone paper on this. And one of the things that was very obvious at the start was everybody was very worried about treatment. Okay, systemic treatment of cancer patients, and in particular two specific treatments. Obviously, chemotherapy. Worried about immunosuppression and all the rest of it. And I was very worried about immunotherapy. I was worried that we were thinking that really bad outcomes with SARS was due you know, by a very strong immune drive. And I just wondered whether immunotherapy actually might might make that immune drive even stronger and might actually cause worse outcomes. So we've been assiduously collecting this and we've now got very, very clear outcome data on this. The first thing you can say is that for chemotherapy, there is no added risk for chemotherapy versus either no treatment or versus no chemotherapy. And that importantly is age, sex and comorbidity corrected. Okay, it's really important. In fact, the solid cancers, the odds ratio um, that we've just pulled out is actually 0.61, which is statistically significantly better than having no chemotherapy or no other anti-cancer therapy. We wondered at the start whether patients receiving chemotherapy for hematological malignancies were at greater risk, but with some clean data, we've shown that that's not the case. So chemotherapy does not increase the risk of dying um, if you come into hospital or present to hospital with a positive COVID swab. Um, interesting question about the immunotherapy. So we've looked very carefully at this. And in fact, those patients on immunotherapy and the vast majority of these are on checkpoint blockades. So anti-PD-1, pd one and anti-CTLA-4. Then actually, again, there is a decrease increased risk of death for the use of immunotherapy. And that's actually statistically significant with a hazard ratio, this is unpublished data, but hazard ratio of 0.59. We've looked at hormonal therapy, again, a decreased risk compared with no hormonal therapy. Surgery we've looked at, numbers are pretty small, it's only 93 out of those 3,000. But again, if you compare that with versus no surgery, we've got a hazard ratio of 0.54. In other words, again, that's statistically significant. Um, in fact, some cancers, again, when we look at chemotherapy by individual cancer type, patients with uh, gynecological malignancy, uh, breast cancer, they again, in individual cancers, those receiving chemotherapy seem to do better than those that don't. So we've got no evidence that chemotherapy makes things worse, but critically, no evidence that immunotherapy makes things worse. And if anything, immunotherapy might think things a bit better. In other words, it may be improving your T cell functionality uh, and therefore having a much bigger hit on that initial T cell attack on the virus. Um, so we're pretty sure that we should be putting out the message very, very, very loud and clear that it's safe for our patients with cancer to receive chemotherapy and immunotherapy. And we've got to accept the fact that if we're not giving these treatments, we're doing our patients a disservice. If they're not getting adjuvant therapy on time, then they're going to be at greater risk of dying subsequently. And at the end of the day, there are certain cancers that have been transformed by immunotherapy so that we've got long term survivorship and potentially long term cures or cures rather. You know, if you think about melanoma and some lung cancer patients, now we've got five year survivorship, which is really very impressive. And again, these patients deserve the chance to have a good quality outcome with their therapy. And we've got this data now and we're quite convinced by this. That this is something safe to do. And it's a message that we've really, really got to get out there. Well, you're bashing that message out today, Gary, loud and clear. I heard that. Claire, would you like to add anything to, to what Gary has said so loudly and clearly? I mean, I think Gary obviously is um, extremely well placed. Um, he has the data. He treats the patients around rebutting some of that early data from uh, Wuhan and Lombardy, which put the fear of God into um, a lot of cancer clinicians and particularly medical oncologists about that risk balance benefit of, of, of how to treat their patients. And all, um, I, mean, I, th I think, you know, cer certainly in spring last year, um, essentially just telling certainly people with advanced disease to, to, to stay away from hospital and stay away from treatment. And it's fantastic that Gary's team uh, and nationally, um, as, as we have excelled in many other aspects of data collection, we have been able to pull together those comprehensive data around tumor types, around specific treatments to really be able to unpick that and to reassure our community that actually, if these drugs deliver benefit, then, then that benefit is very much maintained and, and should be delivered to the patient. Um, so I think to, to, to um, speak to, um, and there are a number of questions in the chat and what Gary was saying earlier, um, the key issue here around the impact of waiting lists and so forth is around how much are we delaying each patient 
and what is the impact of that? And that is going to vary widely by tumor type, tumor stage. Um, and essentially, if you take patients who you were treating with curative intent, any patient group with a particular tumor type, stage and age will have a 10 year survival. And you as a reasonable proxy for most solid tumors, if they're alive at 10 years, they're cured. So if you take, you know, um, say, stage two bladder cancer, around about 50 to 60 percent of them would be alive in 10 years time. And then 50, uh, 40 to 50 percent would die from their disease. If you delay that cohort by one month, two months, four months, six months, um, from observational data, um, we can estimate the impact in that proportion. So you create a per day hazard ratio that you apply to the, the rate of death over those 10 years. And as Gary said, it's very sizable two months, three months, and certainly six months wait, you start causing a lot of deaths. And again, if you think about the underlying age group, firstly, they have a slightly different prognostic pattern, but actually the mean life expectancy in this country is around about 80 to 81 years. So if you take 60 year olds, then actually that 60 year old would be looking at having a good 20 plus years life expectancy. And if in fact they succumb to their disease within a few years because of that delay, and they were actually going to be in the counterfactual group, they were going to be survivors and they were one of the proportion who was tipped into being non-survivors, that is a significant impact in terms of life years lost. And those were some of the types of analyses we were trying to pull together, both, both quantifying the impact of delays and also possibly trying to shine some light on, if there have to be delays, which groups will suffer most from delay and which groups will suffer less from delay. Um, and this work is entirely generalizable. It's not specific to COVID-19. It's any kind of disruption um, or, or delays within your, your service delivery. But it's certainly something I think within the NHS we need to think about more because that's how we, deliver best bang for buck for our services, whether it's during a COVID-19 pandemic or whether it's a, a routine kind of winter flu or whether it's just normal day-to-day, month-to-month practice. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Neil, have you got anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, just to say from the surgical side, when the uh, first surge happened, there was terror in the surgical community because the COVID surge data and others from Italy uh, and so on suggested that if you got COVID during the recovery from major surgery, you had a five times risk of death. Now, that data has been teased out a bit, and that teasing out has suggested that if you were in a COVID light green pathway site, that was considerably reduced. And there's some other work coming out based on HES data in the UK, big numbers not yet published, suggesting that uh, actually, if you compare death rates as a whole, with the previous non-COVID time, there hasn't been an excess of deaths around surgery for, if you like, major surgery, major uh, surgical interventions between the two periods. So that's very comforting. So we can say that surgery is no more dangerous now than it used to be. Now, the problem is, uh, as Gary suggested, this, I, this, this whole business of what we might call upstaging is concerning, isn't it? Because not only will there be the delay, but the delay will have an effect on the surgery. So the tumors will be more advanced, they'll be more sticky to take out, more difficult to take out. Uh, and all those implications for the restarting of our surgical practice. So we're not going back to doing nice little easy operations. A proportion of them are going to be bigger, more difficult operations. You think we're gonna see more bigger, more difficult operations, Neil? Well, I think with the delay, inevitably there'll be an effect, won't there? Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. Gary, would you like to comment on what Neil's just said? Yeah, I agree entirely with Neil. Um, you know, if, you, if you think about adjuvant chemotherapy which for colorectal cancer, which we know improves survivorship, um, we know that if you leave adjuvant chemotherapy long enough, then you no longer get any benefit. And the cut point where you've got literally no benefit at all is probably around the 18 to 19 week mark. There's been lots of analyses done of this. So if you think about 
an 18 to 19 week delay in your surgery, which is not unfeasible, then it's going to be an 18 to 19 week delay in your adjuvant therapy with an increased risk of micrometastatic seeding and micrometastatic take. Um, and so, you know, even with that small example, it's, it's bound to be the case. I've seen quite a few rectal cancers presenting really, really late where they've been at home, frightened to go to the GP, frightened to, to come to the hospital, getting more and more pain and more and more discomfort, and then coming to their first clinic appointment where they've been diagnosed, completely inoperable tumour, you know, can't even sit down in clinic. Um, so, you know, and I, I, I don't think one would be seeing so many late presentations. I, as I said earlier, you know, if you're getting a presentation up through the ER, then that by definition is as advanced as disease, you know, with a lot of stage migration. And um, that, I think, is a big problem. I think it's partly patients not wanting to break their, you know, lockdown and being frightened to go to the hospitals because they're frightened of catching COVID. It's lack of real access to primary care. And I think uh, Claire made a really good point about telemedicine. You're quite right. I mean, I do virtually all of it now over the phone. Do you really have a clue what it looks, what they look like? Until you see somebody in front of you and you can make a proper adequate assessment of their performance status and their pain, et cetera, et cetera, you've got no idea. They'll hide things. They'll say, yes, doctor, things are fine. It's no problem, doctor. That's what people do. But, you know, that doesn't give you a really good idea of what's actually happening in a granular level. So I think it's, it's not just that surgeons are maybe doing something in intensive care and anaesthetists are doing, you know, lots and lots of ventilation of COVID patients. It's also about that lack of wanting to present, if you like, with a problem, um, just simply because of lack of contagion and, and a lack of access to, to primary and secondary care. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Gary. And I, I, I noticed that you've got to have, you've got to have face to face consultations with patients. You, you can't just do it all down the phone or on a screen. So, Claire, would you like just to talk a little bit about nosocomial infections and perhaps blend that in with reduced capacity in the NHS? I mean, I, I think this was this was certainly a massive issue last year in all hospitals. We just hadn't got on top of it. The staff were all getting sick. We, we all sit in these really crowded offices. And I remember going into the Marsden and I went into the junior doctor's office and I was just watching them, touching their phones, sharing the computer, eating their lunch, touching each other's computers and, and then taking their phones into the wards and, and so forth. And I, I think we did get much better, not to mention all the swinging doors and the light switches and, and so forth, that, that in comparison to the Research Institute in which they had implemented absolutely kind of aggressive sanitization every hour it was just the sort of the irony that that within the nhs and the hospitals which, which were teeming yeah. with high rates of yeah. disease yeah. the ability to change the practices and the processes is slow so certainly i think nosocomial infection was a huge issue spring last year and back to neil's point certainly those big cancer operations um that 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 if they need five, seven, 10 days recovery, the number of interactions with healthcare staff that they have over that time, um, the likelihood of them acquiring nosocomial infection rate, you, you, you can sit there and do it on an Excel sheet if you want that, you know, if it's a 5% a infection rate per day or a 3% infection rate per day, that, that the function, if you're there for 10 days after a Whipple's, you know, you're extremely unlikely to go home at, at the end of 10 days without having contracted COVID. We have got much better, but it is still a significant issue. Um, and, I, and I think, again, e each upsurge that, that being within a busy hospital, moving between departments, um, however much the hospital is, is, is trying to screen their staff and implement containment policies, it's very challenging. So I think that um, there is definitely a factor, these big operations. So as Neil wow. said, the big operations, you know, that they are, they have much more impact on the patient. They're having a big operation because they've now got stage two or three disease, which means their overall prognosis is poorer. And it puts them in hospital longer, which does invariably put them at risk of COVID, which is exactly what they were scared of in the first place. Um, so I, I think there is a big piece around there. I think we really need to try and get cancer diagnostics all over in cold sites because again the majority of people coming in for investigation of cancer won't have a diagnosis of cancer you don't want them to come in for investigation for cancer and go home um with with COVID-19 and infect their family 
Um, so I, th I think there are lots of issues here. And again, it, it's it's having infrastructure and pre-existing models where we can quantify this intelligently. Whereas I, th I think e even now it, it, it's it's based on sort of empirical gut instinct trade-offs. Okay, that's really interesting. Sometimes I, I get the impression that people who work in hospitals think they're immune. They're immune from disease so they can carry on behaving normally. I think we've now learned we can't do that. Um, so Neil, what you, you, your views on this? Reduced capacity, perhaps? Yeah, so I think Claire's, Claire's brilliantly argued for, um, if you like, cancer and orthopedic hubs and all the other hubs we've been talking about. It, it of course means something, as you remember, you can't anymore go from the emergency room where you've just been doing an emergency operation in a red hot site, walk onto the ward to see your post-operative patient from yesterday on a green site. You have to also have uh, quarantine staff. You have to have a group of staff who aren't seeing the hot side at all. And of course, that's very, very difficult to organize, but yeah. that's going to be the way to do it. You have a hub and all those staff who work in that hub are going to be only doing that and they're all going to be tested regularly and they're all going to be really careful they don't get too cuddly in the coffee room yeah and that's the way to do it yeah yeah great great so i agree with that entirely we're actually developing a separate cold site so that's where we're going to do our elective green work as it's called so gary i just want to move on a bit we've had a question from sarah o'dwyer who as you know is a surgeon in the christie she asked do you have views on the medico legal implications on cancer progression? We don't know the scale of this yet, but I think the likelihood is enormously higher that potentially we're sitting on a medical legal minefield with this. Um, patients are being pushed back with their surgery. They're the best will in the world, but at the end of the day, how would any of us feel? You know, I've, I've heard stories, many stories, where somebody has sort of gone fully prepped in the morning to, for their surgery, you know, starved from midnight and then been sent home. You know, in fact, on one Monday alone, three people that I know had their parents or relatives actually turn back two from breast cancer surgery and one from bowel cancer surgery. And inevitably, if that patient progresses, well, what would anybody do? Um, you know, so people understand COVID, but at the end of the day, when you're the person that's got the cancer that's progressing to a point at which you're no longer operable or which you're at high risk of metastatic progression, then that's, that's, that's terrible for that patient. So I, I think there's going to be a huge amount of this. We've already seen, you know, complaint letters coming through of, you know, very angry patients that have been delayed on their surgery. And as I say, it doesn't matter with the best will in the world, you know, we, we are physicians and physicians first do no harm. And for a patient and their relative, there is one patient, and one relative, that that's the person that they're worried about. So although we don't know, I think there needs to be a concerted thought process uh, within government actually as, as how to deal with this because at the moment we're still in the midst of it and you know but when this all starts to wash through and the numbers start to really pick up then there's got to be a serious discussion uh, around what the what the implications are and how trusts are to deal with this really how they to answer this uh, and deal deal with it medical legally but uh, i do think it's it's potentially it could be bad news right claire you're nodding you're nodding um actively yeah, I mean, I, th I think it's extremely difficult on an individual patient level because you don't know the counterfactual that in, in, unless you've comprehensively staged them at point one and then you delay them, then you comprehensively stage them again and they have now progressed formally from one stage to another. But as a group, if you take a group of patients who have stage two disease and you leave them all for on average two or three months, a proportion of them were going to have um, developed metastatic disease anyway, and a greater proportion of them will develop metastatic disease um, down the road. The problem is you don't know which ones were in group A and which ones developed it as a result of their delay. And I think, I think we will uh, empirically, if we have delayed lots of cancer patients, we will see patients whose disease would have been cured by their treatment not being cured and they will present with metastatic disease and they will succumb to their disease in a relatively short space of time so we will see excess deaths over the next 10 years I think the challenge will be picking out the signal from the noise 
um, and ha how much you can attribute them to co COVID-19. They won't come clearly boxed up as COVID-19 attributable cancer deaths. Um, they will just they will be excess deaths over and above the, the number by um, uh, cancer type and age group and so forth. So I, I think I think it'll be it's the data will still be very difficult to unpick. That's really interesting. Neil, Gary's point, cancellation, of course, as you'll know, Humphrey, has been a fact of surgeons' lives even before the pandemic, which points to a major problem with uh, capacity, which just wasn't there and has now fallen over. And um, I would like to see that addressed, but I'm, I'm kind of frightened that the medico-legal storm will take away the money that we might have either or otherwise invested in capacity. Maybe we need to come up with some kind of no-fault compensation yeah, regime, yeah, especially yeah. post-pandemic as a way of coping, because we don't want the lawyers to make all the money out of it. Yeah. And uh, in terms of surgeons and medical staff, you know, we're saying, keep brilliant notes. At what point did you first see the patient? At what point were you told you couldn't do that operation? At what point was the operation cancelled at midnight? At yeah. what point, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Keep brilliant notes to protect yourself. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. There was a great... Um, anaesthetic sections series on no-fault compensation and medical legal issues at the end of last year. It was, it was fascinating. I learned a lot there. Gary, you were going to say something. Yeah, I agree with Claire that, you know, we know that as a group of cancer patients, there's going to be increased more mortality in stage migration. But for an individual patient, that means very little. So that if you've been diagnosed or and then you've been delayed and then you get metastatic disease and you progress, you will put a claim in. You know, if you think about most of the medical legal stuff that comes through, it's basically about delayed diagnosis. In other yeah. words, for a CT scan in June, for a you know, kidney stone, and they missed the colorectal cancer, and then December presented with you know dark disease. You you just you can write these, and these are very very common scenarios that you see in the medical legal situation: delayed diagnosis, not picked up on the scan. So you know, I think you're going to see a lot of these at the moment. People are still quite shell shocked by the whole experience, but. As people come out of this and they start talking and they start seeing the reality of what's happened to delay, even if, as you're quite rightly right, Claire, you know, you can't on a single one be absolutely certain about that. Just using a sort of rule that the longer you wait, the worse it's going to get will mean that inevitably there'll be people trooping out to the solicitors to try and uh, to, to put in claims. Um, and I think, as Neil says, there needs to be some very serious thought how to deal with this over the next year mm. to 18 months, because otherwise, as you say, we're going to spend an inordinate amount of time dealing with these complaints as they come through. Mm. And again, as Neil says, you know, it could be enormously expensive at a time at which the NHS is absolutely on its knees. And a lot of the issues around screening, for example, and, you know, a complete drop off in that as Neil says, really reflects the fact that the, the investment wasn't quite there. It was already right on the edge of what it could actually mm. cope with. You know, we know now from the data that we need a lot more operating rooms. We need a lot more, you know, screening endoscopy suites, for example. You know, so that added investment's got to come and that, uh, you know, can't be at the cost of, you know, huge amounts of time, effort, money spent on lots and lots of medical legal cases. But, you know, would, it, would a patient be not... Uh, reasonable for them to do that of course it would you know i think a lot of people listening to on the line if it was their mum or dad would do exactly the same yeah claire come back again. Uh, just to add briefly to gary's point um and and as neil was saying that that we we function at much lower capacity than many other services in europe so so we're we're always sort of trying trying to squeeze the most out of a of a of an underfunded service and and this has really bitten us now but it's not just endoscopy suites it's not just frontline staff it's actually investing in everything it's in the glue that makes us be able to be nimble and dynamic because actually a, a lot of a lot of um, operating theatres lay empty and surgeons standing there with with, with unoccupied hands because of the organisational um, limitations that, that we just don't have the IT systems, we don't have the management and it doesn't allow us to be nimble and adaptive and make the most of what we have. So I think it's not just investment in the front line, it's it's investment in everything. Right. And, I, and I think that the, the pandemic has, has really sort of it held it up uh, held it up to the light, but hopefully our politicians will act on it. Uh, and as both Gary and Neil have said, that we won't get diverted by uh, the sort of me medico legal backlash, which, which fails to allow us to build in response to this. 
really interesting. I think those surgeons standing in the operating theatre looking at their empty hands are waiting for those big sticky operations to turn up. Isn't <laughs> it? Um, so I'm going, to, I'm going to take Chairman's prerogative and just ask one more question to you all. Um, and, and this is about, we talked about the bad things. I'd like to talk about the good things now that have come out of the pandemic. Uh, Rick Bryan also talked about this, one of the questions he asked. We've had lots of questions, so thank you for your questions. Um, and that's, I'd like us to reflect on the innovations which have come out of this pandemic, the good things, the positive things that have come out, and perhaps how certain practices have, have accelerated and changed. So if we could, if you could each answer that question, I'd be very interested in your views on, on, the, on the good things that have come out of the pandemic, not just the bad things. So perhaps, Neil, you could start with that, that response. Well, I'll just say one thing so I don't pinch everybody else's. I think the real transformation has been, we've been asking for years and years and years for good technology around the MDT. It's been completely transformed by Teams or Zoom or whatever. Yeah. Everybody can join in, everybody can get there. They don't have to rush through the traffic, park their car or anything like that. It's absolutely brilliant. And it's been really, really good for team building too. Yep, I totally agree with that, Neil. It's great. Thank you very much for that comment. Um, Gary. So, I mean, I think one of the two, two points I'll make, like Neil, I don't want to take everybody's thunder, but um, I think, to be honest, the NHS has, has been a great credit to itself and seeing people coming together the way they have has been an, an amazing experience. I mean, people are getting tired now, not surprisingly, but I think, again, that has been something we should be very proud of, that we can pull together as a, as a, as a healthcare nation and, and really make a difference to people. But for me, the one thing that stand out as somebody that does a reasonable amount of research is that we've got to totally and utterly transform our R&D structures. Um, for very, very many, many years, it's been very slow in the UK. It takes for absolutely ever to get an idea that you might have as a light bulb, you know, laying in bed at night time to actually a fully executed trial that's actually running. You know, it's like years. And by which time there's already a publication out from an American group. So the R&D stickiness has got to be sorted out. And what we've seen here, of course, with programs like Catalyst, for example, and Recovery, is that actually we can do R&D like super quick if we want to, you know, and again, we've got to take the learnings that we've had about setting up good quality clinical trials in COVID and directly translate them to particularly cancer, where we need to be much, much slicker, much nimbler, much quicker, so that not only can we do our investigator sponsor studies, but that we can attract decent quality studies from pharma into the UK again. Um, so for me, that speed and nimbleness that we've seen, and also the massive amounts of cash that have been splashed into this, this there and we need to make sure that we get those r d benefits and that cash benefits diverted towards our patients with cancer that would be my biggest sort of benefit thing potentially but we've got to realize that and transform our r d structures for cancer brilliant well, that's happening Gary, i presume so claire you're the last one on this panel to say the positive things that have come out of this please i mean i i would echo as gary said that you know a lot of fantastic teamwork within the NHS and as Neil said better use of technology MDTs and also telemedicine they told us for years we couldn't do that seemingly we can um, but I will speak to what I, I do more of around data um, and as Gary said suddenly a lot of the governance issues and the, the very very draconian regulation around using data was lifted by PHE and PHE rolled up their sleeves and got people the data they needed got the got a secure um, research environment got data in there rapidly and again we've done very well as a country both around our rapid analysis of our national COVID data we were slow to start but um, uh, picked up quickly and we now do that very well and likewise again PHE and the National Disease Registration Service making cancer data sets and other data sets available to investigators easily so that's a, something that we want to stay because it allows us really to give near real-time intelligence on what's happening. Um, it's not perfect, but it definitely, there's been big inroads to improving the rapidity of that data availability. So hopefully that's not a, a sort of rug that's pulled away again. Yeah, that's great, Claire. Thank you very much. So it's, uh, it's 1.20. I would like to uh, thank Claire, Neil and Gary for giving their time and their views to this webinar, which I've enjoyed very much. So thank you very much. Uh, next Thursday, Simon Wesley is talking to Robert Dingwall, who is Professor of Sociology at Nottingham University. I'd also like to 
inform you that we now have a climate change and health series. And that starts on Tuesday the 16th. And we're looking at the RSM at climate change and the impact that has on health. I think that's going to be a fascinating series we're delivering. So I'd also like to point out that we are, as many charities are, in, in difficulties. So if you have some donation you'd like to give to us for this series, we would very much appreciate it. So thank you very much and have an enjoyable rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye.